A win, a clean sheet and a goal. Norwich City get the new year off to a fine start with a 1-0 win at Charlton. But will it prove to be the turning point? There's a lot of hard work ahead in the Premier League and that is what we are here to discuss in the latest episode of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast in association with Future Radio 107.8 FM. I'm your host Dave Freezer, joined as ever by Paddy Davitt and Connor Southwell. Boys, let's uh, let's get stuck straight into the game. Uh, five players back available and they get the result in the end. But Pad, um, I suppose you might need to paraphrase, uh, but <laughs> we were far from impressed after the half-time whistle. Yeah, no, that's putting it mildly. It was, uh, I think I tweeted at the time, you couldn't overstate how poor some of those Norwich performances were. And thankfully, uh, the man who matters, Dean Smith and all this, he clearly shared that same view because uh, no messing, re-emerged with three different players. Uh, hooking, let me think now, we got uh, Zolis, didn't we? Uh, Yanulis and, remind Dow. me, Dow, yeah. The fact that I even had to think tells you how forgettable their performances were. And, uh, <laughs> But in their defence, it could have been any one of you know the other eight. I think maybe they maybe exempt Tim Cruel from that. But um, they were they were well. I mean, for a new year, it wasn't a new start. It was more of the same. Desperate December again, and um, thankfully, those changes and the, the calibre of attacking option they were able to introduce, namely of course, Mio Rashica and uh, Timmy Puki, combined to see off plucky Charlton. But you know, even then. Uh, we thought it was Gunter in real time. I think it was, uh, I've got the team sheet here, actually. I think it was the other fullback, Purrington, Ben Purrington, who's had a cannon against Tim Cruz Bar in stoppage time. But for that, we're going to extra time. So it was fine margins. And uh, ultimately, a win, a clean sheet, and a passage into the next round of the FA Cup. You can't, you can't dismiss any of those. Um, but I think we'll need to see far more evidence, starting with West Ham on Wednesday, to, to feel that there's any sort of watershed moment being reached. Um, because that first 45 was well, more of the same and, and in many ways more troubling because you're playing League One opponents. It isn't Premier League opposition. Um, and yet they were still, and we'll probably drill down into it in, in key areas of, of the performance, still nowhere near the levels required. So uh, all in all, yeah, a win, but uh, nothing really I felt coming away from that game that would, would lead you to arrive at a different conclusion in terms of where the Premier League season is going. No, I won't repeat too much of what I said in my video verdict. You can watch that on our YouTube channel or head to the video section of the Pink and Plus app. Uh, we will come back to Pink and Plus later because we uh, can reveal our January transfer signing, which we're all very pleased with. Uh, we will come back to that later in the show and you'll see plenty about that. But essentially, I, I said in my verdict, Connor, that if they play anything even close to that against West Ham on Wednesday night in the Premier League, they will be in deep, deep trouble because that first half, I just thought it was calamitous. There were so many moments where, you know, Josh Sargent would take a terrible touch or the one that sticks in my mind is Lace Malou and he, he had the opportunity to shoot, but almost knocked the ball five yards away from himself. And by the time he caught up with the ball, so were two Charlton defenders. It was... It was another game where the away end were having to entertain themselves and, and the gallows humour and all the, the the chance, which the players probably don't appreciate. But it's tough luck because they weren't giving the fans anything positive to sing about, were they? No, they weren't. It was it was completely flat. It was uninspiring. They didn't really create anything. Um, it was very concerning, I think, watching it from that perspective. And, you know, ultimately, the result will probably mask it a little bit and mean that we can maybe look forward um, rather than probably reflecting on this as as maybe poorly as we would have done if the result would have gone differently. But uh, there's no getting away from the performance. It wasn't good enough. I thought too many heads went down really early. Um, just and, and, and in cup ties like that as well, when you're playing a, an inferior opposition in terms of league position and, and, and you're away from home, what you need to do really is just control possession to assert to assert yourself to to control the game. Uh, and Norwich didn't do that. They were nowhere near good enough in possession. They weren't good out and out of possession. They um, were out four. I thought in the first half as well. They didn't look like they wanted it as much as Charlton. Um, it was interesting. I think uh, I've, I've seen a few tweets about some of Darren Kenton's um, words on Radio Norfolk, where he, he kind of said that he thought some Norwich City players were hiding um, in in terms of in possession, which is which is interesting and, and probably concerning to hear from, from an ex-Norwich City player. So, 
Yeah, I mean, there's it was it was just a really disheartening, uninspiring, flat performance. And I think as uh, as Pad said there, really, it, it kind of um, followed on from the concerning trend that we saw in December. And I think Dean Smith probably looked at it and was really concerned by it as well. Hence the changes at half time. But uh, I mean, the the lack of creativity against a side who are in League One, not doing that well in League One as well, by all accounts, even though they picked up under Johnny Jackson. And I mean, the only chance they really created was a Kenny McLean shot from about 30 yards that flew over the bar. So, yeah, uh, really concerning. There were a lot of players who had opportunities to grab chances, I thought, and didn't didn't do that ahead of the Premier League. Um, obviously, the game against West Ham and Everton. And, and, and ultimately, it took uh, a substitution. It took Milo Rashica and, and Timu Puki to come off the bench and change the fortunes, I, I thought. And for as much as we're going to rave about Milo Rashica, um, it's probably concerning from Dean Smith's perspective that he had to do it as early as he had to do it because the game, I mean, we were all sat there really concerned about where the cup tie was going to go because it, it looked to be only heading in one direction and, and it looked to be heading in Charlton's direction. So, yeah, they got through it and that's the main thing. And as we've all said, probably in the final analysis, a win was what was needed more than anything. Um, so you probably sit here and, and, and rather take a poor performance, but a win and cup progression over a, a positive performance and a defeat. Um, but, yeah, still some really concerning trends as we head into what is a very, very difficult away game at West Ham on Wednesday. Yes, well, let's park it there then. And I hope that I never have to talk about that half football again or think about it again. <laughs> but um, I may not get my wish. I'm, I'm putting that half down to basically oh, uh, European countries where they have a proper winter break, like Germany. They tend to have a pre-season friendly, don't they, to get them back up to speed. Norwich only had, say, what, 10 days off, basically. But almost that half, I'm just going to write it off as that was like a, a mid-season friendly for them to, to get up to speed. And maybe we can extend that across the whole game. But thankfully, Pad, things did get better after half time. We can now look forward to, to, to sort of tentatively, to a fourth round trip to Wolves um, away at Molyneux. Possible reunion with John Ruddy, who played in their game. They beat uh, Sheffield United 3-0 at home, didn't they, to, to progress. Um, and and what was pleasing to see from my point of view, and I'm sure it, from those 2,200 away fans in at the Valley, was that Smith reacted. He could see how bad it was. He clearly had, well, he won't, he doesn't like admitting these things, does he? He sort of says, oh, no, no, I didn't. He's never hinted at the hairdryer treatment or given them a rocket or anything, has he? He just said, no, I made the three changes, told them what I wanted to be different. But he did react and his three changes worked and they were much better after the break. Not hard, not hard though, was it? Because there was show. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he got a tune out of them. And, and that's kind of a parallel with the first two or three games where, you know, it was almost getting put into mystical proportions how he could deconstruct the game in real time, in contrast to Daniel Farker alongside his assistant Craig Shakespeare. You know, the, the Southampton game, that first first game, that first 45 minutes, that was that was definitely not a break with the what had gone before. But, you know, as we know now, he... Campbell came off, Sergeant went on, the much maligned Sergeant. Uh, they pressed a lot higher as a collective in midfield areas. And Rashica, obviously, as well, tactically got switched to the left and, and he hasn't looked back. And, and that theme continued yesterday. And what's probably different between the early part of Smith's reign and yesterday was players like Milo Rashica being available. And there's no doubt about it. It was graphically illustrated. If you take whatever you, you think about, do Norwich have enough quality to stay up this season? They do have quality at their disposal. They just don't have enough of it. And and the the lack of depth uh, it was graphically illustrated in those two Christmas games. You know, the 5-0 against Arsenal, the 3 against Palace. Um, scratch below, not all that deeply below the Norwich frontline options. And by that, I'm talking Rashid, I'm talking Pookie, I'm talking Hanley, I'm talking Krul, right, primarily. Uh, and Norman, of course, who wasn't available at the Valley. But... Without those players, uh, the wheels have, have come off pretty dramatically in December. And um, now the fact that the majority of those were back and will be hopefully back if they can steer clear of injury and illness. Norman, maybe another month or so, still to get a firm return date to train him. But things should improve, should improve on the park. Now, whether that's enough to improve to keep them up, I think we all probably just doubt that's the case because there's too much too much work to do now and there's already that gap between them and three other clubs and the rest has opened up, uh, you know, what are they, nine points to 16th away now? I mean, it's a huge gap 
at this stage of the season. So, um, but I think what we have a right to expect now, uh, certainly those fans have a right to expect, is that that Norwich's level of performance between now and May is is on a level far better than what they'd shown in December. You know, no goals, no wins, no points, unable to really keep teams out at the other end. And then that unleashing everything we've seen so far, you know, in terms of the negativity among elements of the fan base to the point now where, you know, the ownership uh, changes amongst some maybe younger elements is uh, is is hard to ignore. And uh, all of that stems from what they aren't seeing on the pitch. So ultimately, I think we can hope that the second half of the season, with the caveat that the key players stay f- available, stay healthy, will be better. But I don't think that's going to be enough to keep them up. But um, but it was good. It was good to see in that second half the beginnings of yeah maybe a team who could be a bit more competitive than they were in December when it was frankly embarrassing watching those two games of football. Uh, and you feared, and obviously West Ham this Wednesday is one of those that was postponed. Leicester would have been the other game on New Year's Day. I think it would have been a similar story in both of those two games because fundamentally the Norwich squad is nowhere near good enough. You could argue maybe the eleven is nowhere near good enough, but certainly the squad is is a long way short. Um, and we don't need to open this up into a debate again about recruitment, what they did or didn't do in the summer. But fundamentally, that's what Smith has probably encountered now, I think. that At the start of his reign, when he had all his best players available, yes, he felt Norwich could be competitive. You take those out on the level of absenteeism that they had, they're nowhere near the level. And that was, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Dean Smith or Harry Houdini or whoever, you're not going to be able to get a tune out of a group who aren't really up to the level. Um, so let's hope that the second half against Charlton was was a sign of better things to come. But I don't think anybody needs to run away with the idea that they're suddenly going to go to West Ham, turn them over, beat Everton uh, comfortably at the following weekend. And then the great escape is on. I still think it's going to be probably ultimately end up where we all feel it's heading. But you'd like them to put up a bit more of a fight than they certainly put in, in December, that's for sure. Absolutely. If, as you say, that four-horse race becomes a three-horse race because Norwich drop out of it early, that's going to be very, very difficult for a good chunk of the Norwich support to stomach, I think. And then we could well see a, a bit of pent-up frustration and, and anger come pouring out. But we'll we'll come back onto the positives in just a minute. Um, but I just wanted to bring you um, some audio of my chat with Milot Rashica after the game, um, which... I enjoyed more because he assumed the traditional pose that all footballers should be in as they're being interviewed by the media. He put up one leg on the advertising hoardings and leant on his knee. And Chris Gorham tweeted a photo of me and um, me speaking to him. And I just thought that's exactly what, what a player should be doing. Looks like he's concentrating on what he's trying to say. But of course, he had a smile on his face. And frankly, those player interviews haven't been much fun recently. Speaking to Kenny McLean after the 5 0 against Arsenal, he. The last thing he wanted to be doing at that moment in time was <laughs> was talking to the media. So uh, we just thought you'd bring we bring you a, a little bit of positivity from a Norwich player. Milo, Hi. how are you, how are you feeling after that? Then? <laughs> uh, yeah, the win is. It feel very good after the win because we didn't win in a long time and uh, we go to the next round. So I'm very happy for that. When the ball hit the back of the net, you know it's been a little bit of a wait for that goal. How, just how were the emotions at the time? Yeah, it, I think the goal also came in the very good moment for us because we we start to take over the game and after a difficult first half we try to to build up better and have some better chances and uh, yeah it was a great moment for all of us and for the fans also how's it been in the camp in the squad because you five games without a goal and the games that were postponed and all the players that have been out does it feel like it's a new year and now you've all got a bit of a chance for a fresh start? Yeah, after some difficulties, even at the start of the beginning with the tough games and COVID and injured players and everything, it was just a little bit too much for us. That everything happened in the same time. But uh, yeah, after a little bit break, I hope this will be the, the turning point and uh, we can start this year in a much better way. How about you personally? How, how's the? So it was a groin injury, wasn't it? How, how's that doing? Yeah, I had a little bit of problems and it... I was out, I can say, almost six weeks, so I, I did a good uh, rehabilitation and everything went well, so I hope today was good to get some minutes and uh, we won the game, I scored the goal, so I hope this will be a big confidence, not only for me, but for all the team. 
it came at quite a, a cruel time for you as well because you'd had a really good game against Wolves, hadn't you? So you must have been very frustrated personally. Yeah, because I was in the great shape, I think, and uh, we had a very good few games before that and it was just a bad moment, just a little bit slippery in the training and the way it happened, it really annoyed me a lot. But yeah. uh, I worked hard and I tried to give everything to, to come back as soon as I can. And uh, yeah, now we have a few more games to in our hands so we will try and do it better so you personally what what do, what do you have sort of aims for the second half of the season is there like a certain amount of goals or assists that you're looking for to be honest uh, doesn't matter at the point we are who score the goals or who give the assists we just need to to go in every game like uh, it's a fi from now on every game is like a final for us and doesn't matter who score or give assists we just need to win points as much as we can what do you make of your song from the fans as well to the tune of tequila <laughs> yeah i didn't hear it now in four or five weeks but it's nice to hear it back and i hope we will hear it much more in the in the future So yes, Mr. Rashidza, um, how how impressed were you with him? I, I noticed you had a a good little XG stat that you mentioned in uh, in our Q and A on Monday lunchtime. Yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up now. So I mean, just it just shows his his influence. I think more than anything. So uh, for those for those fans of expected goals, I know not everyone is, but uh, Murray City racked up zero point zero two in in the first half, which is um, very very little. It's essentially a shot from range and, and scraps. In the second half, it was it was up to one point three nine, which is a healthy amount. It's more than Charlton enjoyed. Um, Milo Rashica produced zero point seven two of that, so the vast majority of it. Um, 0 0.31 uh, racked up as well by Sargent. So that's a, another interesting element maybe to get into a little bit later on. He did on, get but... one on target, didn't he? He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, from from quite a difficult angle as well. It's probably yeah. the hardest chance he had a lot. But, but anyway, but yeah, I, I, I thought he, he posed a real threat. And I think there was actually, for me looking at it, there was uh, something quite interesting where Norwich had noticeably less of the ball, but were more effective on the break with Milo Rashica in the side. And I just wondered if they could maybe develop a formula where they get him in the side and get him running at, into space because that's clearly what he wants to do and um, maybe are a little bit better against the ball because I think we, we saw in the first half, this is a Norwich team that simply don't have the quality to control possession um, or, or nor the players to really, certainly not when Billy Gilmore's out of the team. Um, so I think he does give them a different element. He's direct, he's strong, he's physical, he's willing to run at players, he's willing to um, to, to take a risk, I think, in possession as well. So I was really impressed with, with what he offered. And uh, I think it was probably the continuation of what we saw just before his injury, where people were beginning to get excited and impressed by him. And um, uh, and rightly so, I think, because there's clearly a very good footballer there. It's, it's just now about transferring this output into a Premier League setting, which is, uh, as we all know, much more difficult. Um, uh, and credit to Timu Puki as well, because I thought he was, he was excellent when he came on. And you, you think about the times in the last few years where Norwich have needed some inspiration from an attacking sense. Um, I mean, few more have, uh, have produced maybe Emi Buendia than, than, than Timu Puki in, in those moments. And, you know, a few strikers um, probably would have had the, the willingness or selflessness to square the ball when he did and, uh, and credit to Rashica for getting himself in the position. So it was a well-worked goal. It was one on the break. And um, I, I just wonder if Dean Smith will look at it uh, and spot the kind of counter-attacking prowess, I suppose, that maybe Milo Rashica has. Because if Norwich can utilise that, then maybe we're going to be talking about a more effective attacking unit that may be the way that they're going to get more goals out of this team at the moment. Yeah, I, I think Pukki adjusted well because the the ball took a bad bobble, didn't it? Just before he he crossed and he that because I think he was initially going for goal once McLean had put him through, but he he realised that the angle had become too tight and then he picks out Rashica pretty well. But Pukki as well, Pad, there was a lot of, lot of love for him really, wasn't there? For the way that he drove them forward and almost was a bit of a, a spearhead and a, and a talisman. The way he worked, like that moment when he charged back into the left-back position to, to help um, deal with a with a defensive worry. And um, yeah, I, I suppose that with him and Rashica and, and probably Williams, you could expand this too. I think once those two came on, I felt like there's two Premier League players who are now playing against the League One team. Yeah, which should have been the case in the first half because they heard they all are, all are technically Premier League players this season, but it clearly wasn't. Um, mm. And that goes back to my previous point. I'm not going to labour it, but you know, within that squad, there are Premier League quality players, and then there's the rest. And sadly, 
the former category uh, is the minority, which is probably why Norwich are in the pile of state they're in. Um, so it is absolutely imperative that those two, I think, between now and the end of the season, stay fit, stay healthy and stay on the park. And maybe to develop Connor's point a little bit, I, I, a lot of talk about systems and personnel, but both of those players, Puki and Rashita, offer you that ability to stretch the play, to run down the side of players, to run into the channels. Um, and you can see the effective, effectiveness of that if it is in a more counter-attacking philosophy, which we take it right back to the start of the season. We probably thought when we looked at the, the recruitment and Rashica came in with Zola, so maybe that was the way they're going to go. And, and they didn't directly maybe replace Buendia in, in, the, in the 10, in the pocket. Didn't turn out to be the, the way, unfortunately. But uh, I just think they're not good enough across midfield areas, um, despite you know the presence of Billy Gilmore to dominate teams through possession and con control the tempo uh, of games that way. So for me, ultimately, their best bet might be to try and utilise, um, I mean, we don't need to get hung up in terms of uh, for base formations, to use Daniel Farker's uh, phrase, but certainly Rashica playing off a Puki uh, in a two or a one and a one. I think that's probably as good as it gets for this Norwich group at the minute in terms of what they can offer in the final third. Um, and that might be something that Dean Smith has looked at in that second half. And I know with the caveat, it was Charlton and it was League One opposition, but could we maybe see that again uh, at West Ham on Wednesday night? Because there's no doubt those two players will trouble Premier League defences with their pace, with their ability on the ball um, and just their game intelligence. And I, I think you could see most visibly, obviously, in the way the goal was constructed. But those two are, are maybe on the same wavelength, to, not to the same degree, clearly, as Buendia and Puki, because that, that was a relationship that was forged over time. But you just do get a sense, watching them two, that they understand each other's games and, and what they're trying to do. And um, I'd personally like to see Smith incorporate that into his attacking spearhead, whatever the midfield and the, the defence behind that looks like. But those are your two best attacking players. I think it's evident. So they both need to be in the side and they both need to start games. Yeah, right. Well, let's throw it forward then and, and look ahead to West Ham on Wednesday night. And moving on from what you said there, I can't quite get my head. Well, I, I think Smith will probably sit with a 4-3-3, bring Poheta back and have him and Rashica as proper wingers. He's got probably got to stay with the same midfield three and then possibly bring Gibson back in for, for Kabak, depending on how Hanley's feeling fitness-wise. Kabak's a an odd one for me because, you know, he goes on another one of these buccaneering runs, but he gets tackled, loses the ball and Charlton end up breaking and having a chance. He was better in the second half because he seemed to settle down. If you can take the rash moments out of his game, there was some good defensive work in there. But at the moment, I just wonder whether Smith's going to look at him and think, I don't know if I can trust you over Gibson or, or Hanley, who we know have got an understanding and have got the experience. And the height, I just, I feel like maybe we forget how young Kabak is, and that he he clearly still has a has a lot to learn to, to mature as a centre back. I'm I'm not sure he's the man I'd be throwing into it at, at the moment, but we shall see. I, he clearly has ability. It's either that, or as I pitched to you guys in the car on the way back, do they switch to a a three five two uh, and use Williams and Aaron's as the right uh, at the as the wing backs, and then as you teed up there, Pad have Rashitza in and around Puki. I'm not I'm not quite not quite settled on on where we, where they where they should go with it yet but west ham connor i mean they're having a very good season aren't they david moyes that they, they, well they've had a, a great year or so they still up in fifth but what seems to be catching up with them at the moment is that they, i had a look before we started recording they've played 30 games this season norwich have played 22 so that's a that's a pretty big difference isn't it but with the players that they've got, Mikel Antonio, Lanzini, obviously Declan Rice is a, is a fantastic player. The, the the only real help is that Saeed Ben Rama's gone off to the Africa Cup of Nations with with Algeria. But Norwich have got to considerably move through the gears and and show a lot more determination and and um, discipline in their shape if they're going to have any chance of of even if they just ground out a sort of nil nil draw like they did at Burnley. Yeah, I must admit, Mikel Antonio scares the life out of me. Uh, I'll be honest. After, particularly after that um, that game in Project Restart, I, I think, oh, yeah. and and how Norwich really struggled to to contain him. It was it was four we got, wasn't it, on the day? And he was he was terrific against a, a Norwich side that was. Uh, I think they got relegated that day, didn't they? And, and it kind of it kind of summed that up. Um, Suchek as well in midfield. Him, him and Declan Rice in there. I think there's there's very few better 
midfield partnerships uh, beyond kind of obviously the, the the top three clubs here, Man City, Liverpool and, and and Chelsea. I think look beyond that, I don't think you get much better than, than Rice and Suchek, although Suchek maybe hasn't been as good in, in recent weeks. I think there are opportunities if Norwich, again, what me and Pad said, if Norwich could hit West Ham on the break. I don't, I don't, well, one thing is I don't think they like possession too much. I think they'd rather be doing um, what Norwich maybe should try and do and hit them on the counter. I think that's, that's probably their strengths. They've got a lot of um, players who, who like to run uh, both with the ball and without the ball. Jared Bowen has, has been, been excellent as he in, in recent weeks. So if Norwich can maybe give them the ball and then look to, to spring on the counter, I think they've got defensive options that, that Puki, Rashica, um, Sargent, even maybe, could, could get in behind and, and cause problems. Craig Dawson, for example, isn't isn't necessarily blessed with pace. Issa Diop has, has had difficult moments um, at, at times. So, yeah, I, I think there's there's probably elements where Norwich can hurt West Ham. Um, but equally, I think it's just, I, I think back to that Palace game and the physicality and the difference in physicality, and, and you feel that that's going to be repeated here. So it's up to Norwich to try and limit that and, and try and prove that, I think. For all that we've talked about the midfield three, given Gilmore's absence is, is probably and Lucas Rook's injury as well. If he's no further forward with that, then it probably doesn't look likely that he's going to be if he if he wasn't on Sunday. Um then it looks like, unless again we're talking about a tweak of formation, it's it's going to be the same midfield three. So I would have a concern about that area of the pitch. Um but yeah, it's 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 a really difficult fixture at a difficult time for Norwich. But if they can go and be competitive, put in a performance, make sure they're competitive. Um then who knows? Maybe there's a possibility for a moment from Milo Rashica from Timu Puki if they can take the form of this weekend into into that game on Wednesday. Then, then maybe there will be an opportunity that arises. Maybe they will catch West Ham on a bad day. And who knows what a win could do for the confidence. But uh, I'm with you, Dave. I think if they could grind something out, if they could get a point going into that game against Everton at Carrow Road on, on, on Saturday, which I think looks a lot more winnable than this one in truth, um, then I think that would um, that would hopefully just give everyone a much needed lift and really kind of galvanise both the team and the fans for, as I said, what I, I think is going to be a fairly big game against Everton because if Norwich can win that at this stage in the season, being only three points adrift, if it stays that, if it stays that way, obviously, then um, who knows? It, it could change It could change everything, couldn't it? So, yeah, I think you, you just try and get through this one. You you take a point, I think, now and and then you, you try and take whatever sort of momentum you can, be it through a good performance, be it through a... Uh, a point or hopefully even three points into, into that game at the weekend. Yeah, Everton definitely look vulnerable. It doesn't seem to be a happy camp under Rafa Benitez at the moment. So hopefully there's some vulnerability, although they've got all week to prepare because the uh, their game against Leicester has been postponed because of COVID cases in the, in the Leicester squad. Uh, of course, the January transfer window is open as well. Let's, uh, let's just uh, talk a little bit of, of Todd Cantwell and that side of things. Um, the only business confirmed by Norwich so far is, is outgoings, youngsters on loan. Uh, Barley Mumba went to Peterborough, so he's looking to get some championship minutes. We all know that he could potentially be the Max Aaron's successor had a scored a really good goal for them um came on at half time in the fa cup against bristol rovers lovely uh weaving run in off the left wing so a good start for him tyrese omatoya saw he got man of the match on his debut for carlisle that's switching across league two he was with Leighton orient but not really getting much game time started for carlisle didn't score but as i say he impressed and uh, tom dixon peters maybe not quite such a positive start to his loan he's joined gillingham in league one they were 3-0 down to Ipswich at home when he came on at half time. They ended up losing 4-0 and having a player sent off in the second half. And Steve Evans has been sacked as manager after the game. So I'm not too sure where that leaves him in terms of uh, that loan development. Hopefully that doesn't mean he get ends up sat in the background because a new manager comes in and, and doesn't want to give a, a Norwich loanee game time. That would be a real, uh, real shame for him. But of course, Paddy, the, the name that's dominating everything is, is Todd Cantwell. And as ever... It seems that there's a lot of noise around that situation, isn't there? A lot of noise. What did I see this morning? I flagged it to you, Connor. It was uh, it was about six clubs from about three different leagues. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to malign anybody, but there's somebody, somebody slash people uh, very actively uh, putting Todd Cantwell's name out there. And we'll leave you to make up your mind who. But uh, um, as always, cut through the noise. Where are we? As we sit here recording on the 10th of January, Todd Cantwell is a Norwich player. There's no firm bids that we're aware of. So um, it'll be interesting when we speak to Dean Smith on Tuesday morning um, regarding Todd's availability. Because obviously, Dean Smith made it clear after the game on Sunday that 
uh, through illness, Todd uh, pulled himself out, I think was the actual phrase that Dean Smith used the day before. So read into that what you want to, as well. But um, made it quite clear it wasn't anything to do with transfer moves imminent or moving forward at a pace. So hopefully we'll get a status update on that tomorrow. But ultimately, uh, until the talking actually stops and, uh, and a club actually are willing to back up whatever initial interest they have with a, a bid that is anywhere near Norwich's valuation, he remains, as he has done in all these other windows where he's been touted with an exit, he remains a Norwich player. And, uh, you know, I guess... You know, if you try and take a view from the outside looking in on these things, it increasingly feels like it's going to be Newcastle are going to disturb what happens at the bottom end of the table in the transfer window. If they uh, are trying to be as active as they clearly are because they need to, given their parlous state at the bottom of the table or near the bottom of the table, already done the deal for Trippier. Saw a report this morning that now Callum Wilson is out for the foreseeable. I think they've got Watford this coming weekend, which you're talking about Everton and Norwich. That's a huge game uh, down the bottom of that table. And uh, Newcastle are trying now to to prioritise a striker in the building before that Watford game. So that might, if we uh, are led to believe that there was tangible interest in Todd Campbell, might just dial it down a touch if the priority at the minute is, is finding a striker. So um, it doesn't feel anything's imminent or anything's moving at a, a rattling great pace. So uh, we might have to stomach more speculation than actual tangible uh, business involving Todd Cantwell for the foreseeable anyway. But I just feel it's really for Newcastle are going to be the kingmakers here in, in what goes goes down, I think, at the bottom end of the table. If they are active and able to do the deals they need to do, then that's going to send quite a few ripples around clubs like Norwich and, and the other clubs down there. And uh, because if, if you take them out of the equation, I, I really don't see anybody really looking to do too much in this window you know there's been a lot of talk about the financial impact of obviously this pandemic and, and now that will that will really bear down quite heavily I've even seen a report today actually that even the loan element of the January window is going to be quite heavily disrupted because of more the more the Covid situation in terms of players coming from other clubs who may have had Covid outbreaks and, and what that means uh, coming into a different group um, you know within very tight confined protocols around you know, isolating and mixing so all of these factors are in play and, and what we do know having spoken to the people who matter at Norwich is that they don't have the finances to do anything unless and until they're able to generate funds by selling and even if they did then I very much doubt that they would embark on anything major in this window because as we all know uh, it's, a, it's a it's a buyer's rather than a seller's market or or should I say the other way around, it's the sellers rather than the buyer's market. And uh, the quality of player isn't available for the right prices that Norwich would want to trade in. So I fear where we are with this is where it'll end up, which is a hell of a lot of talking, hell of a lot of speculation, mainly around Todd Campbell. And then possibly he remains in the building. And, and if that is the case, then we'll only be postponing this to the summer, I think, because ultimately, I've said this a few times now of late, it's got to the point it feels for all parties best to go their separate ways now and um, best for Todd in his career, get that going again, best for Norwich to generate some funds to, if not maybe in this window, certainly they can then push the button maybe on a few summer bits of business or, or at least accelerate some potential summer targets for Dean Smith um, because ultimately Todd Cantwell sat kicking his heels is no good for Todd Cantwell, it's no good for Norwich City. So there needs to be a firm resolution and what we do know is Norwich are willing to allow that player to leave if the deal is there and the deal is right. So I guess ultimately that brings me full circle and is why you're probably seeing his name getting touted with every single club under the sun because the people who are around him will probably need to make things happen this window. And, uh, and there certainly looks to be plenty of uh, reports with his name at the centre of them. But as we all know, uh, you can discount the vast majority of those. But it, it, it did feel before the weekend that there was something a bit more substantive to the Newcastle interest. So we'll see how that develops. But as I say, it, it very much clearly would appear that their priority is a striker between now and the weekend. So if it's a striker, then you would think all their efforts will be going in that direction. And if that's the case, then we won't be hearing any more about Newcastle and Todd Cantwell in terms of a firm bid uh, and, and a deal progressing this side of the weekend. 
Yeah, which all feels like a sad way for a Norfolk boy who's been with the club for such a long time for it to come to an end. But I'll park that until it actually happens and we have something more tangible to discuss because we're recording Monday afternoon, the day after the, the Charlton game. Nothing's actually happened as as yet. We haven't really heard anything too firm. The ones you've mentioned there is the Telegraph, who um, it was from a reporter who is close to Newcastle, covers them regularly. So everyone was giving that a decent bit of credence. Um, that was saying that Campwell is one that they've inquired about. They did also, uh, the Telegraph and the same reporter said that Newcastle considered Max Aarons as a possible left-back option, which I thought was a, a little bit strange. But obviously they went and got Trippier and he can play on both sides as well. So you'd think that that puts uh, put some mark through that. But the piece in the Sun, which you referenced, which basically read like a press release from Todd's agent, uh, had uh, Leicester, Liverpool, Spurs, Newcastle, Leeds and Roma all mentioned, as well as possible top-end championship interests. So keeping all the markets open right there. The one that possibly in that list could make a bit of sense to me would be Leicester, given how well Madison is playing at the moment. And he seems to have got over that, that. I think it was a hip problem that had been persisting for him. That if Todd was available for... Um, just say 10 million up front with another possible um, five or 10 million in some sort of structured deal, something like that, which is relatively cheap for compared to certainly uh, two years ago. Um, they would almost have a potential Madison successor already on the books that Rogers could be grooming and making sure that he was ready. Cause we all know that he's got creative abilities and that he can do um, that. He can do his, you know, his tricks and stuff in the premier league, but we'll see. Um, We've already spoken a lot about it. We'll speak more about it, I, I, I'm sure. And Pad, you, I thought you you pitched this as well in our window watch video, which was on on Friday. Is that that sort of money um, isn't really going to be enough for Norwich to remodel the squad a great deal either, is it? So, Connor, in terms of just to to bring it to a close with Max Aaron's everything seeming quiet, we've already reported that the only way Norwich is going to do serious business this month is if they can make a. a a proper big money sale it doesn't feel like much is going to change on that front does it no not really um i think it's it's far more likely that max aaron's leaves in in the summer really given um kind of what pad teed up about the current state of the market um we discussed it as well on our monday night club that, uh, that we did on on the pink and plus app uh, specifically about max it's it's very difficult i think at the moment for any club um with the exception of the richest of the rich to to justify spending what it would take to, to buy Max Aarons on a right back, I think. So um, I, I would imagine that he will stick around and, uh, until the summer. Um, but yeah, you're right on Todd. I think it's it's difficult because any fee they've got, ultimately, is, if, we, if we're looking at, at what is being reported at the moment, it's around 15 to 20. Of course, um, we don't know how much Norwich would be willing to take in terms of structure and in terms of add-ons and because you can quite cleverly make a, a 10 million pound deal look like a 15 million pound deal quite easily so um again it, it, we don't know until if or, or when these things happen what it would actually look like in reality but um not all of that money would be reinvested obviously so again you, you may be looking at, at five million pounds or potentially that pays for a loan fee and covers some wages for the rest of the season on a player which i think would be probably the likely way that they'd, they'd have to do it because i think it's a very difficult proposition to sign someone permanently in the, in the position that they're in um at least someone who is willing to join a premier league team rather than uh, maybe a championship team as the case may be in six months so uh, we know they've got a foreign loan spot left to use it, it would make sense if that would be the route that they went down should they should they get some money but it's an incredibly difficult market, I think, to, uh, as Pat said, it, to, to to sell players in, um, particularly to get decent fees for for players. I think it, it tends to be players on the fringes or in a little bit of difficulty or in the situation that Todd Campwell are in at the minute. And um, you're right, Dave, it would be a sad end, I think, because I, and I wrote about this a, a week or so ago. It, I think everyone would be kind of left with a, a what if feeling. Todd would be kind of feeling, well, maybe not now, maybe when he sits in his armchair as a uh, as an older man, he, he'll sit there and maybe think, well, what if I, uh, I maybe gave a little bit more or Dean Smith will be thinking at some point. I just wonder what if we could have got a bit more out of Todd Campwell and uh, and who knows what direction Norwich City season may have gone in because we all know the quality that, that he has um, and, and it hasn't been for whatever reason on, on display this season. So, um, so, yeah, it's a sad end, but I think it is probably the right, the right time for, for all parties um, to 
maybe consider a, 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 as amicable a divorce, I suppose, as, as maybe is possible at the moment. But yeah, from Norwich's perspective, you consider the kind of fees that are being touted for him after relegation two years ago. It would represent, I think, even though it's not a loss, it would it would maybe feel like a loss on a player who they've put in a hell of a lot of work and time to develop. Right. Let's leave it there then. Uh, at least they got a win. Um, a clean sheet and a goal. The drought was over. They avoided equally in that club record six consecutive game uh, without a goal. Uh, they could uh, equal that in the, the league, of course, if they don't score at West Ham. But I sincerely hope we see a bit of fight and a bit of determination. I'm sure fans will go along with that. But we will close this week's pod with the unveiling of our January transfer signing, which you may have spotted by the time you're, you're actually listening to this um hopefully you've already had a look at pink and plus at the moment it, there's still 30 you get still get your first 30 days for free 199 a month um and a couple of good examples for you are ncfc live blog during yesterday's game and the q a from monday lunchtime um, we certainly feel like the the sort of level of conversation has risen a bit in terms of uh, they're not being the trolls around there's not ipswich fans getting involved, trying to wind up Norwich fans and all things like that. So uh, we're really pleased with the way Pink and Plus is developing. And this is the next step. So drum roll. It is Norwich's record Premier League goal scorer, our new columnist, the one and only Chris Sutton. Speaking to Connor about becoming our new columnist. Thank you very much for listening. Welcome back to the Pinkin channels. Now, we're braced for a very quiet January in terms of Norwich City, but uh, the Pinkin have gone out and made uh, a big January signing of our own. Um, we're delighted to announce a very new columnist. It's a familiar face to, I'm sure, Norwich City fans out there. Mr Chris Sutton joins us, Norwich City's all-time Premier League uh, record goal scorer. So um, that's a nice accolade to have, and we'll get into that in just a moment. But Chris, first and foremost, columnist for the Pinkin. That's a, another string to add to your numerous bows. How pleased are you uh, about that? No, I'm delighted to uh, to come on board with the Pinkin. It's uh, it's a paper I'm very familiar with. Um, you know, back in the day when I used to go and watch my dad play at, at, at Yarmouth Town, we always used to get a Pinkin on a on a Saturday evening, and but you know, it's a it's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant paper. So I'm delighted to uh, to be working for the Pinkin now. I'm an ageing signing now. Back in the day, you know, I think I was a you know a pretty good value as a as a player, and uh, I hope I can bring something to the Pinkin. I'm sure you will. I was going to say uh, we've got you and Roberts as a columnist as well. So as a front two, that's that's pretty formidable, isn't it? I mean, you didn't get the chance to play up front with you, and but that that would have been that would have been nice. At least you get to do it in terms of words, I suppose. Yeah, there would have been a few elbows flying around, I think, with uh, with myself and Ewan up front. Not the quickest front line, uh, but no, Ewan was a fantastic servant to uh, to Norwich City. I love, you know, I enjoy reading his um, his columns. Yeah, I catch up with him very occasionally in uh, in coffee shops around Norwich. We both like a coffee, um, but no, I'm a big fan of Ewan. Good stuff. Um, I guess the obvious question is, what can people kind of expect from from your columns? Uh, people obviously see you and and your punditry in uh, on the radio, on the television, up in Scotland as well. You, you, you do lots of stuff. So, what can they expect from a, a Chris Sutton Norwich City column? Um, well, honesty, I think is you know is the most important thing. Look, I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, of, of Norwich City. I'm a, you know I count myself as a as a Norfolk boy. I was brought up you know, just outside the city, a little village called Horsford. And, um, you know, as a, my dad played for the club and I follow the club closely. I, um, you know, played for the club for, for five years. Um, you know, I read your columns, Connor, and what I like about your columns is, you know, I know that you love the club as well, but, you, you know, you're, uh, you're honest. And I think that's the, the most important thing. You can't pull the wool over people's eyes. This season has been uh, an awful season. Uh, one of the worst seasons that, that I can ever remember. Now, Norwich still have a, a chance of retrieving uh, this season. But, uh, you know, most fans have been bitterly disappointed. A big outlay in the summer, a record outlay, and the team just haven't performed on the pitch. Absolutely. And we're, we're going to touch upon uh, Norwich's season a little bit later. But just back to you. I mean, that, that accolade, you obviously went and did some magnificent things in your career, won the Premier League, obviously played for England, uh, played for Celtic, so, some massive stuff. But in terms of that Norwich City record that, that you still hold, I guess two elements to this question. One, are you, are you still surprised that you hold that record? Maybe not given 
Norwich City seasons in the Premier League, particularly in the last 10 years or so. But B, how does how much does it mean to you? Does it mean anything to you, I, I, I suppose, is, is maybe the question? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, that that season, that would have been 93-94. That, um, that was the Bayern Munich season. Uh, was Yeah, it was the Bayern Munich season, uh, I think. Yes, it was. Uh, 25 Premier League goals. That's, that's a big deal. Now, I did go into... Uh, into the club to do a, like a, a shirt presentation and Stuart Webber did remind me that that was a 42 game season uh, albeit uh, you know 25 goals I think was a was a, a pretty good haul and then you know I, uh, I moved on to Blackburn Rovers and you know had a good time uh, at Blackburn Rovers but I've got great memories and you know the biggest uh, you know memory probably would be Bayern Munich of my time then but also standing in a tunnel uh, with the Norwich City team, knowing that we were capable on our day of beating absolutely uh, everybody. And, you know, we were a, a little bit gung-ho uh, as a team, but I had a lot of good players in that team. The likes of Ian Crook and Rule Fox, who were, you know, a, 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 a big help to me in terms of creating opportunities. And I was just there to, to stick them in. Well, you, you did that very well and certainly better than anyone in, in yellow and green has done it 42 season or 38 game season. That's for sure. Um, ever since, uh, certainly the, the numbers show that you, you spoke about that Bayern Munich game. Are there, are there any other kind of memorable moments that really stand out from your, your time at Norwich? I'm sure there's there's probably a fair few. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that whole season, you know, um, Mike Walker, the impact that he uh, that he had at the club, I mean, you know, the 92-93 season, we were favourites for relegation. First game of the season, I get hauled off at Arsenal. Uh, we're 2-0 down. Mark Robbins comes on as a substitute. Uh, we win the game. And, you know, that was a season when Norwich City actually nearly won the Premier League. We actually weren't that far off. Not that we believed it. But, you know, they were times when we felt that we could, uh, you know, really, really compete against all the, all the top sides. And, as I say, we had a, a team on our day, uh, players who were who were capable of taking the game to anybody, and it was it was a, a a great learning curve for me as a as a young player to come into a team with so many experienced players with top flight um, experience and quality, and uh, you know it was a, um, a as I say a brilliant learning curve, and I kicked on and had a, a a pretty decent career off the back of my time at Norwich City, but that's where I made my name for myself. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose maybe there's that Norwich team, there's the Leicester team as well. But do you think it's becoming rarer in modern football for a team like Norwich City, for example, to compete for the Premier League title with all the wealth and all the, all the way that clubs are run in the Premier League and I suppose the size and magnitude of it now? Yeah, I think so. You know, you, you, you look, um, I don't know, keep, keep saying back in the day, it wasn't that long ago, but, <laughs> but it was more of a, it was more of a level playing field, um, you know, with clubs, finances and... Uh, you know, not that Norwich City were a wealthy club back then, but, uh, you know, with, with the way that finances now dictate transfer markets and, uh, and, and uh, you know, players coming into clubs for extortionate fees, Norwich City have never been able uh, to compete back then. It was a level playing field and, uh, and, and certainly we could compete. Now the game has changed. Having said all that, I do think that the current team should be doing much better. Yes, and and on to the current team then. We, I mean, we, we sit here after 19 games. It's halfway through the season. Uh, Norwich have scored eight goals. You're obviously a man who did score goals and they have players in that team who have scored goals in the past. Team of Buki, probably the, the most noticeable. What do they do to improve that output? I, I suppose it's it's almost an impossible task in the second half of the season to get it up to a to the place they need to be to, to stay in the Premier League. Still only three points adrift. I mean, we, we spoke about that a little bit before we started hitting record but as a former striker how do you look at it now and and what are you seeing that they need to improve on in order to to ensure that the goals are a bit more consistent well i think you know first and foremost you know the team have to improve in all areas but scoring goals it has been a massive massive issue all season you know i watch norwich play and i wonder how they are going to score a goal i think you look back to the championship and bundia who was clearly an important player he'd get on the half turn and slide balls through uh, to Puki, they had a great understanding and, and a, you know a great relationship. I think clearly Norwich City have missed him, but other players have uh, have come in and just not stepped up. And I think that's uh, you know that's a big issue for Dean Smith. I just wonder whether he will go. And I, I, you, you're better versed to answer this maybe than me. Will go into the transfer market and and look for an addition uh, up top because 
you know, Timo Pukki really has carried the team um, with his goals and he's not scored enough. But Norwich City need to create more opportunities. I've, been, I've got to say, I've been slightly disappointed with Adam Eder. You know, it, when, when I look at him, he has, you know, great physical attributes. I think he does OK in games, but I think he could offer far more. And he's had his opportunities this season. I think he could put himself at, uh, about a lot more than he does. Um, but, you know, clearly goals need to come from other areas. Todd Cantwell, last time Norwich City were in the Premier League, I think he got six six Premier League goals, something like that. Um, and, you know, that's a bit of a head-scratcher, what's happened to, to his career. But I think that Norwich City are at the stage now where things can't get any worse. And, you know, the, the players just need to show a bit of courage. They've hit rock bottom. And eventually you think, well, you know, this this is embarrassing for us, you know, the way the team have performed. We need to show we're Premier League quality and uh, nothing to lose now. Everybody expects Norwich City to go down. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd expect the players to use, um, you know, the humiliation factor in many respects as a, a, as a tool to get the season up and running. Absolutely nothing to lose. And when, you know, when, when, when they get chances and in and around the box, you know, to, I mean, what did I used to think when I was in, you know, in, in my pomp, as we're seeing with Pookie again? Pookie didn't, doesn't think when he's on fire. And I used to, you know, not think too much when the goals are going in. And I think at this moment in time, hesitation is what's killing Norwich City. As a striker, you cannot hesitate. You know, you can't have time to, to think. You have to be proactive, make runs. And I think there's a there's a fear of missing chances at Norwich City at this moment in time. And that that has to change. I know there's a goalkeepers union, so if there's a strikers union, then it might preempt your, uh, your your answer to this next question. But when a team isn't scoring goals in the way that Norwich City aren't, there's a lot of focus on the strikers and what they are or maybe aren't doing. But in Norwich City's case, is, is the answer simply to go out and get another one and, and hope that he's the one to score the goals? Or actually, are, are there wider issues behind that? Because we're, we're looking at attacking midfielders and as much praise as perhaps Milo Rashica got before his injury, still only just one assist from him, still no goals. Yeah. And, no goals in that forward line really at all. So what is it for you? Is it is it just the striking issue that Norwich needs to sort out? Is it kind of the players behind as well? Well, you know, I think we've, you know, seen enough games this season. Um, Norwich City don't create enough chances, enough opportunities. And it's, it, it's not one of those situations where... Uh, fact of the matter is, you know, I think back to the, it was it was the Wolves game where I think Pukki had an opportunity and was it Lucas Root Lucas towards Root, the end yeah. of the game had a chance. And, I, you know, they were two guilt edge opportunities. I can't think of too many other times other than the, um, was it the big miss earlier on in the season, Josh Sargent with the open goal where Norwich have had unbelievable chances. And they need to find a way of creating opportunities. And then, you know that that would be a you know a, a a big step in terms of moving forward. But at this moment in time, you know, I, I watch Norwich play, and I think, how on earth are they going to score a goal? You know, how are Norwich City going to get up the pitch, and 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 they look lost. And that's you know, I'm not blaming Dean Smith for that. I think he's had a hell of a situation to take over. Maybe Norwich City could get confidence from the fact that uh, Southampton in the second half and the performance against Wolves. Manchester United, I thought we all thought that, uh, that, that, you know, the club had turned a corner with that, but Manchester United have been rank rotten and, you know, since then. Um, but, you know, now's a chance where uh, the players have a, have a chance to put it right. And as I say, I think that, you know, if I was sat in the dressing room or part of this current Norwich City squad, I'd feel humiliated and embarrassed what's happened uh, this season. And I would want to prove... I'm a Premier League player. And I, I, look, I don't know the mentality within the dressing room. I don't know many players personally. But, you know, you don't want to go through your career um, with people sort of pointing the finger saying that you're a good championship player. You want to prove yourself at the highest level. Bottom line, too many players have underperformed. Absolutely. Just finally, then, I don't want us to go in too much depth, given that you've, you've got a column next week and, and, and that will probably uh, maybe address some of these issues in, in a bit more depth. Um, we'll, we'll see. But just finally, Dean Smith and uh, what do you make of him since he's taken over? Because it's, it's probably been a little bit difficult for him in the sense that he had pretty much a, a healthy squad to pick from from the five games. And you know, I think we both agree that performances did improve. Uh, they also got the win against Southampton, the draw against Wolves that you mentioned, that performance against Manchester United. And thereafter, he's been kind of well, having to kind of shift through a squad that 
has been decimated by COVID and injury. So do you think it's fair for Norwich City fans to judge him maybe uh, at this stage? It's still too early to tell how he's going to sort of coach Norwich City and what Norwich City are going to look like under Dean Smith in the long term? Uh, yeah, look, I think it's it's far too early to, to really judge him. I mean, you've mentioned the COVID situation and injuries. And I think that's, you know, that it's been a, a major factor. Dean Smith, I think, wanted the game off against Aston Villa where, uh, you know, Norwich City were comprehensively uh, beaten. And, and, you know, he's he's got a, a big task, hence why he got the job in the first place. The team were underperforming under under Daniel Farke. You, you can't get away from the fact that uh, the signings which were made over the summer other than Matthias Norman, uh, probably just haven't been, you know, that good and haven't performed to the level which would have been expected. And I think that's been a, you know, a large part of what's uh, killed Norwich City this season. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to get excited about Rasicha. Um, and you said, you know, one assist all season. You know, he hasn't really performed. So we're looking for things which maybe haven't been there more through more through hope than, than absolute confidence with what we've seen with their own eyes. But you know, there's a chance to to turn things round. I think you know the likes of Hanley coming back in, and and when Norman is fit again, Norwich City have a better chance uh, when they play. But you know, scoring goals is is going to be uh, a, a big ask, and and quite how he um, how he turns it round, Dean Smith. You know, remains to be seen. I do notice, you know, I follow the club on Twitter that they often post little finishing drills, and uh, you know, and you see players hitting the back of the net. I'm not. I'm not too keen on that. You know, I think that uh, they should be keeping things under wraps. And uh, and when Norwich start scoring a barrel load of goals again, maybe, maybe post more stuff. But um, as I say, it's an opportunity for the players now. Everybody expects Norwich to go down. You know, everybody's been critical uh, of Norwich, and I have to sit on the radio and on television sort of defending the club at times for its model. But bottom line is, is 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 the team need to. Uh, need to do do much better and you know the manager is the one who who carries the can but i don't think anybody expects uh, norwich city to stay up uh, this season under under dean smith but that's that's his challenge i just think looking at the league table it's been it's been awful it's been so bad i'd be thinking we can't play any worse than what we did in the in the first half of the season and because of that we we have a chance there are, there have been you know a lot of poor teams in the premier league this season we have a chance to retrieve it get out of it there's a generous run of fixtures coming up so show some courage prove people wrong there's nothing better than within football to uh, to prove people wrong everybody's written norwich off Lovely. I'm glad we've ended on a, on a positive note, Chris. Thank you very much for, for your time this afternoon. And of course, you can read Chris's columns uh, in the Pinken and uh, on our Pinken Plus app as well. Delighted to have him on board. It's, uh, it's going to be brilliant to get his opinions every week. And I'm sure uh, you guys will enjoy reading them as well. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's good stuff. We'll catch you again very, very soon. Thanks for watching.